Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to today's Tips and Tricks webinar with Professor Philip Quirk from the University of Leeds and ONI Senior Scientist, Dr. Andras Mikloski. Focusing on revealing spatial information at the nanoscale in clinical tissue samples using SMLM. Before the webinar begins, we'd like to go over some quick house rules about the webinar. I'm sure you've all noticed by now, uh, but you do have a webinar navigation panel on the side of your screen containing a few different sections. And if you'd like to more clearly see one specific section, you can simply click the expand icon located in the top right corner of each section. Today's webinar will last about 45 minutes, leaving approximately 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. And you are welcome to submit any questions you have throughout the webinar via the chat section, which is located within your panel. However, we will only be answering your questions during the Q&A session. And if we were unable to get to your questions, then we will email your answers separately via the email address that you registered with. Within your navigation panel, you will also find a handout section. Here you can find our company brochure telling you a bit more about O&I and our offering. So please feel free to have a look there on our website, um, of course, located at oni.bio. And please note that today's webinar is being recorded. Within the next day, you will receive a thank you for attending email with a copy of today's webinar to refer back to. In addition, a video recording of today's webinar will also be stored on the resources section of our website. And now I'd like to introduce everyone to our presenters for the day, starting with Professor Philip Quirk. Philip is a gastrointestinal pathologist, head of division of pathology and data analytics at the Yorkshire Cancer Research uh, Centenary, professor of pathology at the University of Leeds. He has a long-standing interest in bowel cancer. He's had an impact on improving outcomes in this disease through improved pathology, surgery, and clinical trials. And he is interested in developing super-resolution microscopy into a tool that is used in routine pathology. And now on to Andras. Andras is a senior scientist in the applications development team and has been with ONI for over five years. And during this time at the company, he has worked on several key academic and industrial collaborations, facilitating the adoption of super resolution microscopy across multiple fields. He conceptualized the technology that led the development of the first generation EV profiler kit and is currently working on projects that will expand ONI's consumables portfolio. And with that, I will now pass the presentation over to you both to begin the webinar. Thank you, Caroline, for the introduction. So today's webinar, in today's webinar, we are gonna be focusing on how single molecule localization microscopy can be used to extract nanoscale spatial information from clinical tissues. But before we jump into discussing the exciting developments, I wanted to give a brief overview on what we're gonna be covering during this webinar, starting with a brief introduction to the technology landscape for tissue imaging, an introduction to single molecule localization microscopy or SMLM, how you will hear, how you will hear me refer to um, the abbreviation over the course of the presentation, followed by the sample types, that are compatible with single molecule localization microscopy, tissue preparation workflows and protocols, considerations for imaging that aim to improve the quality of the data, signal to noise and other um, performance metrics, followed by analysis and output metrics, exemplified by case studies, then finally as uh, was presented earlier, a Q&A session during which we'll try our very best to answer everybody's questions. So jumping into the technology landscape, um, there's a number of technologies that have been used over the past couple of years to image tissues. One of these techniques is electron microscopy, 
this technology provides nanoscale resolution and it's very well suited for imaging and characterizing very fine structures in within cells or tissues. However, the sample preparation in certain cases can be quite difficult as, the, as it requires a series of specialized reagents and equipment. In addition to that, multiplexing, uh, meaning detect detecting two or more proteins can be quite challenging. There's another technique such, uh, such as confocal microscopy that has also been pretty broadly used for imaging anywhere between uh, organelles in single cells all the way up to imaging tissue sections that are up to potentially a centimeter uh, in width in 2D and in certain cases 3D. And this technique is very well suited for multiplexing as confocal systems are usually equipped with multiple lasers. However, if the aim of the experiment is imaging large, uh, large tissue volumes, such as entire organs, like an embryonic brain here that I've inserted, then the best choice for these uh, tissues is um, light sheet microscopy. This allows fast, fast imaging, fast acquisition. However, it only provides cellular resolution. So if the aim of the experiment is to, for example, detect changes in mitochondrial structure or lysosomal structure together with imaging an entire brain, this technology uh, may not be the best for that. So now that we kind of covered what sort of techniques are used uh, for imaging tissue and what is the range of these tissue, uh, of these techniques, I've inserted in, uh, I've added this image here that shows, well, these techniques. And then here you will see that there's a series of techniques called super resolution microscopy techniques that allow the bypassing of the diffraction limit that is not possible, for example, with light sheet or even a uh, confocal microscopy. So there are several uh, techniques that are considered as super resolution as they bypass the diffraction limit. One of this is TED. This provides roughly 50 nanometer resolution on average. There's another technique called uh, MinFlux. This provides anywhere between one to 10, potentially even more, uh, even lower resolution, depending on what um, samples are used. However, in between two are a series of techniques that rely on single molecule localization microscopy. So single molecule detection that through which um, it's possible to bypass the diffraction limit, and some of these are D-Storm, Palm, and Paint. In today's webinar, we'll be focusing on single molecule localization microscopy and mainly on the D-Storm version of it. So how, how do we obtain a single molecule localization image? Um, most of us have used a uh, confocal or traditional wide field to detect various structures, organelles, for example. And what we usually see with traditional wide field or even confocal microscopes is that the individual elements of a larger structure are usually blurred out. So what I'm referring to is elements of a structure that are closer th to each other than uh, 200 nanometers, which is the limit of diffraction and any two structures that are closer than that together, uh, it's impossible to tell apart where the end of one substructure begins or so where, where the end of one structure is and where the beginning of the other, uh, other is. And this is due to the fact that all the fluorophores are on at the same time. So in case of single molecule localization microscopy, um, there's a reason why it's called single molecule localization. So it's a clever technique that relies on exciting the fluorophores using a high-powered laser together with an imaging buffer. And what happens under these buffer and irradiation conditions is that the fluorophores start to blink. So that means that on one particular frame, you will only detect a single fluorescence event. And then on another frame, you will detect potentially another one coming from another part of the structure. 
And what this results in is the spatial and temporal separation of these detection events. So then what we can do now that we uh, detected these individual events is that we can figure out where the center of each of these events are through a process called localization. Then we continue to acquire multiple frames during which we acquire multiple spatial and temporally separated fluorophores, localize them simultaneously. Then finally, we reveal a super resolved image where the ultrastructure of a particular structure is clearly visible. So moving on to the types of samples, types of clinical samples that are compatible with uh, single molecule localization microscopy. So there's a number of um, sample types that are compatible. However, we'll be focusing today on the tissue samples, which can be, uh, which can be prepared using a variety of techniques or uh, protocols. One of these techniques for preserving tissue is through uh, formalin fixation, followed by embedding in paraffin. This is a technique that's broadly used in histopathology labs for both clinical and R&D purposes and has been, done, has been done for a number of years now. There's other techniques such as uh, freezing tissues uh, without any fixation. These rely on taking a biopsy, for example, quickly embedding these tissues into a freezing media, followed by um, dunking these in, this, in a container in liquid nitrogen cooled isopentane. And the result is hopefully that the tissues are cooled at the perfect rate where uh, everything is preserved nicely. There's another way uh, that is again used relatively often that we can fix and preserve tissues. And the outcome of this fixation are samples that are of course again compatible with single molecule localization microscopy. And this is through perfusion. There's a few, there's slightly more steps here than in case of uh, the previous two. And of course, this is a bit more complicated as to some degree this is done while, for example, your model animal mouse is still uh, sedated and live. Then, as I mentioned, there are other samples that are used in clinics, such as cytology samples, where cells are spun down onto the cover slip. However, um, since this is not tissue, we're not gonna be focusing on these type of samples today. However, I just wanted to briefly mention that these sort of samples are fully compatible with imaging and the staining protocols that are used for tissues and cells are also fully uh, transferable to this one, to these sort of samples. So as I mentioned, there are several ways of fixing um, tissues, meaning these, these tissues will have different um, need to have need to consider different considerations in these cases so for example knowing that the formal fixation and paraffin paraffin embedding process is a very nicely very well documented standardized process as i mentioned it's used in a uh, broad range of histopathology labs for different applications has been so for a number of years now which means that uh, there's a lot of samples that are archived that are now stable for multiple years. And so researchers and clinicians or uh, drug development uh, companies, for example, can access some of these tissues and design experiments uh, or studies that have a high clinical value outcome. In certain cases, it may also be possible to extract, for example, information from longitudinal studies. However, uh, this is a bit more difficult in general. However, in certain cases uh, where good antigen or great antigen preservation is needed, perhaps users can rely on fresh frozen tissues. As I mentioned before, um, these samples are not preserved uh, before using uh, fixatives. These are just rapidly frozen. So if the freezing protocol is not done very carefully uh, following the right method, then what can happen is that the freezing process will uh, completely destroy the tissue, in which case the tissue is not completely lost. 
It's just it may not be suitable for imaging anymore. However, maybe for Western blood or other biochemical methods, uh, it will be suitable. Then there is another way of delivering the fixative, as I mentioned, through uh, perfusion fixation, which is then followed by a brief immersion fixation. So this is great, and it provides nice distribution of the fixative, which then leads to great structural preservation. However, it may be obvious, it's probably obvious how and why this technique is not transferable to clinical uh, settings. However, if the aim of the research or the development is to, um, is for example, a preclinical study on small animals, which, in, which may uh, you know, involve, for example, screening certain drugs, drugs looking at a uh, mechanism of action, then doing these studies on small animals, which are then uh, dissected, of course, and preserved using uh, perfusion fixation will lead to great, uh, great samples that can be very useful for such cases. So how does the sample preparation for single molecule localization microscopy look like? Well, uh, looking at this flowchart, you may see that it's actually quite similar to your regular immunohistochemistry or immunostain immunofluorescence protocol. You will see all the familiar steps, starting with sectioning and mounting your tissue. Then if you're doing, for example, FFPE or you're using FFPE tissues, you may need to deparaffinize and then perform antigen retrieval steps, or in case of fresh frozen, you may need to briefly rehydrate your samples, then fix them. However, these are simply just uh, sample dependent deviations from just your regular immunostaining protocol, which is then followed by blocking, staining, then finally uh, mounting these sections and imaging them. So, so far it's relatively similar. However, there's a, there's a few considerations um, or a few points where the sample prep for SMLM differs from your standard uh, immunofluorescence protocol. One of them is that the tissues are actually mounted not on a microscopy slide, but rather on a high precision cover slip. So I'll go into why this is in the next slide in a bit more depth, but briefly I'm going to mention that uh, single molecule localization microscopy relies on total internal reflection fluorescence based uh, detection method and due to that reason uh, we need to use uh, cover slips. Again as I covered briefly uh, in a previous slide we know that single molecule localization microscopy relies on blinking on fluorophores that blink therefore choosing fluorophores that exhibit the blinking behavior in, uh, in, in combination with the excitation laser and the buffer are key. However, uh, we should not be frightened by this because a number of fluorophores that are used for confocal microscopy and are sold by a number of companies are fully usable for single molecule localization microscopy. These can include, for example, Alexa Fluor 647 and uh, different fluorophores that are excited by different lasers. Then, as I mentioned earlier, again, um, since single molecule localization relies on blinking, we need to mount the sections in a blinking buffer, which will differ from, for example, the way that you mount your sections for confocal microscopy, where you would uh, use, for example, a hardening media. Then I wanted to briefly cover some acquisition, image acquisition considerations. These aim to these aim uh, these aim to basically improve the data quality. Some of them may be left as uh, a standard. However, one should consider these at least in the early stages of setting up the light uh, the imaging program. So, as I referred to in the previous slide, uh, forcing a molecule localization microscopy sections are mounted on cover slips because of total internal reflection fluorescence based illumination. So why this is done? Well, with TERF, as we change the illumination angle, what happens is that we restrict the imaging volume to structures that are close to the cover slip, thereby we eliminate fluorescence from out of focus uh, 
fluorophores, for example, which greatly increases the signal to noise. And of course, like for any microscope uh, technology, finding the right focal plane is key. In case uh, the experiment involves looking at uh, two different proteins, followed by detecting the distance or the interaction of these proteins, a channel mapping needs to be done. This is to ensure that the distance that you are, uh, that you then extract, that you quantify, <clears throat> is actually valid and is the correct distance. Then, of course, there's a series of um, settings such as laser power, exposure, time and frame, and the number of frames that one acquires, and all these function to broadly improve the signal to noise and the data quality. There's a couple of considerations that are not, for example, microscope related, but do influence the outcome and the data quality. One of it is section thickness. So this is similar. So basically the reason why we use TERF is also why we recommend imaging tissues that are 10 microns in, in, uh, in thickness or less. So mainly we can remove out of focus fluorescence using TERF. However, if we can provide 10 microns or less uh, tissue volume in the Z plane, then this just adds that extra uh, extra bonus in removing uh, out of fluorescence out of focus fluorescence thereby improving signal to noise so in certain tissue types what we may observe is that there is more autofluorescence this is due to the chemicals that are that reside in these tissues however this can uh, relatively easily be uh, dealt with by using quenching or autofluorescence blocking uh, chemicals and protocols. So now uh, moving on to the analysis and the output metrics, which we will exemplify with a couple of case studies. So we're looking at uh, some interesting patient data where two different proteins are detected and they're there's a number of diagnostics or um, patient stratification or even R&D methods that rely on detecting uh, protein levels in patient tissues or detecting protein biomarkers in patient tissues. And the output of these techniques is usually, is protein A or a protein B higher in a pathological case than in healthy tissue? at varying degrees of sensitivity. And, uh, or for example, another output metric can be the number of cells that are positive for a particular marker, such as PDL1. And since all these techniques are usually done with diffraction limited fluorescence methods, or even uh, immunohistochemistry uh, based methods that are non-fluorescent, some of the details may be lost, which are then of course revealed when looking at uh, patient samples using single molecule localization microscopy. So once we acquire the data using the super resolution technique, we can see that there's actually quite a lot of heterogeneity between two patients that have, <clears throat> that both are, uh, that both have a pathological level of, uh, of expression. So we can see that while maybe with a low resolu lower resolution technique, protein one in case of patient one and patient two may be expressed at the same level, and that may be actually true. However, using super resolution microscopy, we can see that in patient one, protein one forms these larger aggregates, uh, which we call protein clusters, that are not necessarily found in patient two. So what this means is that since in patient one, protein one, again, form these aggregates. Uh, this protein is now spatially segregated from protein two, which again is something that may not be uh, readily observed using, um, <clears throat> using non-single molecule techniques or non-super resolution techniques. So all this data, all this information is visible by eye. But of course, uh, this, this can be quantified and we have developed 
a series of steps that stitch together to form a uh, nice data analysis uh, method. This begins with filtering your data. What this means is that we will remove certain localizations or data points that still come from autofluorescence, for example, or they are low precision. And after this process, after this filtering and thresholding, what we have is a, a, a structure that, well, or a series of structures in this case that have a varying morphology depending on uh, which channel we're looking at, onto which we then uh, apply a series of um, clustering algorithms, which serve as um, segmentation methods, which then allow the detection and the extraction of various parameters on a single cluster basis. So this longer cluster from channel, let's say magenta, let's call it channel one, is one cluster, as, it, as you can see it, and the smaller cluster from the cyan channel, channel two, are also detected. So it's quite a flexible segmentation tool that allows detection and isolation of uh, a broad range of uh, clusters that have varying morphologies. So once we have these single clusters detected, we can run co-localization measurements. Um, we can apply co-localization measurements or distance measurements between proteins or protein clusters from or between the same protein, meaning the uh, magenta here, sorry, the cyan, or we can measure distances between clusters that come from two different proteins. So all these uh, co-localization measurements together with the per cluster analysis um, output. And of course, for each cluster, uh, we have a series of morphological features that are associated. Then taken together, uh, these measurements form a comprehensive nanoscale spatial analysis. So we've used this analysis workflow to look at the differences that we've been discussing regarding patient one and patient two. And as I mentioned uh, before, protein one forms these larger clusters with more data points within them. And we've used to measure this, dif this difference between patient one and patient two by relying on the number of localizations or data points per individual cluster. And you can see that in patient one, the number of localizations per cluster is higher than in patient two. And that exactly correlates with what we're seeing is that there's just larger structures. On top of the information that is accessible with or only from super resolution, such as these nanoscale cluster morphology parameters, we can also uh, use single molecule localization to extract parameters such as expression levels. Right, so we can see that in patient one, in fact, there's a higher expression of a particular protein than in patient two. And these are methods, uh, so these are uh, features that are usually extracted with uh, non super resolution techniques. And this just shows how versatile this technology is, meaning you can get this almost the same information like low resolution techniques. However, on top of it, you get all the benefits and all the additional parameters that you couldn't extract with these. Then again, kind of jumping back to the patient data, since these clusters are bigger and the proteins are more spatially segregated, we were hoping to uh, visualize this and quantify this difference, uh, the spatial segregation using co-localization. And if you look at this graph showing the co-localization between protein one and protein two, what you can see is in patient one, the amount of, uh, of protein one that is non-colocalizing is slightly higher than in case of patient two, and with the colocalizing fraction is the, is the opposite. So this is again, together with the morphological analysis, uh, just a couple of basic uh, analysis that is readily available with this technology. However, hopefully it's, it's, it's hopefully it's becoming obvious uh, what these techniques may provide on top of regular methods 
regular fluorescence or non-fluorescence uh, microscopy techniques that are currently used for, for example, uh, diagnostics, uh, mechanism of action studies, or patient stratification, and how this technology may uh, enhance these processes or methods, techniques. So up until now, we were mainly focusing on looking at various proteins in, um, in, uh, in tumor sections. However, we also wanted to look at not only uh, single proteins, but also we wanted to look at structures that are involved in processes that are highly dysregulated during the uh, tumor du during tumor progression. So one of these structures is the nucleus, right? This is linked to cellular division, again, which is highly dysregulated in tumors, in addition to, uh, for example, the dysregulation of cellular metabolism, in which mitochondria have uh, play a major role. So we stain these two structures. Uh, lamin we detected using an anti, or the nuclear envelope we detected using an anti-lamin antibody, and mitochondria we detected with an anti-TOM20 antibody. We then applied the uh, the single molecule based uh, analysis method onto it to segment and detect individual mitochondria. Then we performed um, a certain analyt analytical steps, which then immediately reveal that there are uh, morphological differences between different mitochondria. Then we looked a bit deeper and we've actually observed and quantified that the mitochondria that are more closely associated with the nuclei, with nuclei on average, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, have a lower area when compared to the uh, mitochondria that are in the cytoplasm. So in this case, we've expressed the area or the size of these identified structures using cluster area. And if you remember in the previous slide, I, I used um, localizations per cluster as the area metric or as the size metric. So I did this on purpose to highlight that our analysis pops out not only one parameter, but it pops out a series of morphological descriptors that allow users to choose, to pick and choose which parameter best suits um, their quantitative uh, workflow, thereby providing uh, flexibility and, and uh, more depth to their analysis. So up until now, we've mainly focused on detecting proteins or structures in uh, various tumor tissue sections. However, single molecule localization microscopy has been successfully used to detect, for example, and quantify the structure of chemical synapses in brain tissue. It's been used to detect and quantify the distribution of proteins in cardiac uh, smooth muscle tissue. Of course, it's clearly uh, usable to detect um, proteins in single, cell, single cells whether they are CAR-T or neurons. Of course, it's fully compatible with detecting purified organelles, such as synaptosomes, which are synapses broken away from the main uh, soma, or even imaging individual uh, E. coli and other bacteria. So before, we, before I hand over uh, control to Professor uh, Philip Cork, I just wanted to summarize what we've covered today. So briefly, just want to go over the fact that single molecule offers, single molecule localization microscopy offers a nanoscale uh, multiplexed workflow. That and then of course this workflow, as I as we've discussed, only deviates in minor ways from your standard immunofluorescence workflow, thereby making it uh, easy to adopt and integrate into your uh, regular uh, lab workflows. Of course, this, uh, this technique is compatible with multiple tissue and clinical sample types. And then together with the analysis that I've just discussed recently, um, this allows the extraction of uh, nanoscale information that is not available uh, using other uh, techniques, other fluorescence uh, techniques. So now I want to hand over um, control to Professor Philip Quirk 
who will cover the exciting uh, developments in using single molecule localization microscopy for uh, renal pathology. Hello, everybody. So uh, if we move on the slide. Oh, here we go. So um, kidney disease is an important uh, dis disease area to look at, and especially because we have to use a wide variety of techniques in order to make the diagnosis. Now, it's a common disease. Uh, we have to take tissue biopsies frequently, which you can see goes through uh, the loin of the individual. Uh, and at the moment, we have to take two biopsies, whereas if we could reduce that to one, it would reduce the pain and unpleasantness of this procedure. Um, and if we could reduce the number of technologies we needed to use, then it would be more cost effective. So we've looked at renal biopsies as a potential way of improving the situation. So what do we look at in renal biopsies? Well, it depends upon the disease, but many of the diseases are glomerular nephritides, which is inflammation of these small structures called the glomerulus. And here's a glomerulus in an H&E, a hematoxin in, which is the way that we usually firstly look at this material. And then if you look at the higher resolution, you can see this glomerulus here. And what it is, is a ball of capillaries, which are surrounded by other structures, and you excrete the urine from, well, you form the urine from the excretion of uh, the proteins and other chemicals through the uh, surface of these uh, glomerular structures. And this is a glomerular structure with these cells called podocytes, which sit on the outside and act as the boundary for um, the filtering. And if these go wrong, then you lose um, proteins and chemicals that you don't want to lose, and you can end up in renal failure. So this is the subcellular structure of uh, this body here and its relationships of a basement membrane and uh, a capillary endothelium. So next, please. So, oops, go back one, here we go. So here it is in greater detail, and what we've put in are a number of proteins that we are interested in, which we'll come back to. So we hope to get improved glomerular disease diagnosis because we can hopefully create simultaneous multiplex detection of multiple proteins in one go, nanoscale morphology and getting spatial distribution, uh, and then it's quantitative because it's immunofluorescence, and this gives us extra added value. Improved sensitivity to make earlier diagnosis because of the high resolution, and we can actually look at all of that renal biopsy, which we can't do with electron microscopy, and there's the potential for using all artificial intelligence to help us make the diagnosis. So it's potentially a very powerful technology. Oops. So, here, yeah, sorry about the, uh, here we are. So basically, um, this is the podocyte. Out here is the urine. You're filtering your blood through the capillary endothelium, through the basement membrane, and it has to go through this key protein, nephrin, which sits between the feet of the podocyte. And we're trying to outline the various structures. So CD31 picks up the endothelium, laminin and collagen pick up the basement membrane, and within that we can sometimes see immunoglobulins embedded uh, when we have immunoglobulins involved in the disease. And then very importantly, we're looking at the nephrin, which is the protein that controls filtration, and the proteins that sit either side of it, such as podocin. Now, the first place to start is looking to see whether we can do it in formal in fixed paraffin embedded material and whether different fixatives make a difference. And of course, different fixatives do. We find that formal saline, uh, paraformaldehyde, neutral buffered formalin, and Carson's, which is an alcohol based fixative. All of these work very well, and these are relatively standard fixatives, especially formal saline and neutral buffered formalin. Buins doesn't. Uh, Buins has picric acid in it, and it's a much harsher uh, fixative. So uh, you can use standard methods for this technology. Now, you also need to know how long are you going to fix it for, because too long fi fixation can uh, ruin the um, visualization. And it, 
we're very lucky in that we can fix for 24, 48, 72, or even 96 hours and still get very good resolution. It starts to go off after that. So you don't want to fix for more than three or four days, but generally probably shorter fixations are better. And this is all done on nephrine, which is the protein that's involved in fixation. So in filtration, not fixation. So here's a number of these proteins. We have podocin, which sits um, in the foot processes. We have CD31, which sits in the capillary endothelium. And you have nephrine that sits between the molecules of podocin. And you can see that we're getting very nice outlining of these structures. They all look different because they're different um, glomeruli. And so you're seeing different structure, but the organization of the glomerulus is the same here. So that's very good, all imaged in the same color. Here we have collagen and laminin, where we can actually put them together as well into a cocktail of antibodies with the same color. But here we're doing them individually. And again, you can see that we get different patterns, but we're actually getting patterns which are uh, compatible with the basement membrane. So they work. And then when we go to doing two color imaging, here we've combined CD31, which is a capillary endothelium, and podocin, which sits in, in the feet. You can see that they're spatially separated by the basement membrane, which would be within here. And so we're getting a, a totally believable ultrastructure coming through uh, on our uh, formalin fixed paraffin embedded material. And then we can move to do um, higher resolution and start to, to quantitate uh, the frequency of the structures and how large in size they are. And we can uh, look at the detected clusters and quantitate the number of clusters and their diameter. So we can do a lot of simple quantitation uh, of these structures, which are extremely difficult to do uh, by any other methodology. We can go further and move to three colors. And here we've got three colors and um, you can see the CD31 from the capillary endothelium, which is in, uh, oops, sorry. We've got, actually, so we've got podocin here, which you can see there, there and there, and that's in uh, magenta. And you can see that here. You can see the nephrine, which sits between those podocytic feet so here's the podocin and here's the nephrine and then we have collagen um, here which is outlining the basement membrane so again you can see they're all in the right places uh, and allow us to look at three different colors and then we start to look at healthy kidney and you can see the glomerulus here which has this nice structure that you've been seeing uh, and for the nephrine, and then we see a disease, minimal change, and this is a disease of the nephrine protein. And you can see the nephrine protein has completely changed. One of the other things to note here is this is a renal biopsy, and these little red marks are where the glomeruli are, and we can look at every single glomerulus here rather than the single or double glomerulus that you get when you're doing electron microscopy. So this enables us to look at a much larger extent of the renal biopsy, which is a big advantage if you have disease that is only focal. We can also look for immunoglobulins, which should not be present. And this is a disease called Berger's disease. And where it's lighting up, this is immunoglobulin deposit within the glomeruli. And this shouldn't be there at all. So we can look not only at the distribution of the structural proteins, but the presence of other abnormal proteins that shouldn't be there and make the diagnosis on that situation. And here is a very pretty um, image of this glomerulus here, where we've actually put four proteins together with three colors. So what you've got is the uh, immunoglobulin, IgG in magenta. You've got collagen and laminin, a cocktail of both of those proteins put in under the same color with 647 in the red. And then you have nephrine in the green. And what you can see is that here's the nephrine and underlying that is the collagen and laminin of the basement membrane. And then you can see the immunoglobulin is not, uh, is 
in the sub sub endothelial area here but also within the structure of the basement membrane so we can get good localization and also do quantitation so we still have our conventional microscopy which is qualitative which we are going to continue to use because it's a fundamentally powerful uh, diagnostic tool we have electron microscopy which is very expensive and gives you limited information on a single glomerulus or two glomeruli unless you actually put through lots and lots of samples and that has an increasing cost or we have the option now super resolution microscopy where we can look at every single glomerulus in that renal biopsy and we can look at these structures one of the interesting things is it's giving us new information about these structures so we're having to relearn our renal pathology uh, which is quite uh, a challenge but we not only do we get these interesting images but we can also quantitate the amount and the distribution of them which is really very exciting so we're hoping to be able to move this forward quite strongly uh, and get it into routine diagnostic practice so in summary of this area uh, the, the d-storm can analyze routine nhs histopathological material this is all taken uh, from patient material it looks possible to replace electron microscopy by a quicker and cheaper method in terms of the reagents we use. Uh, and also the Oni D-Storm is cheaper than buying an electron microscope. And we're currently exploring D-Storm uses for other diseases and we've got lots of data from uh, tumours and from other structures now. And I must give my thanks to Mrs. Haley Slaney. Haley is a uh, a grade six technician who's done a lot of this work, Dr. Scarlett Brockmoyler, who is a clinical lecturer in pathology, and Dr. Deepa Aurora, who is a consultant within the NHS. Uh, the National Institute of Health gave us a grant to work with ONI, and of course, the people at ONI who've been so helpful, Dr. James Felch, Andras, uh, and Anna. So uh, that's me, thank you very much. Thank you for that uh, super exciting uh, insight into what's possible using single molecule microscopy. Um, so this is roughly the end of our presentation. Uh, I just want to uh, conclude that if you want to talk to our technical team uh, regarding any of the specs of the system or uh, request a demo or for example uh, reach out to get some support with sample preparation um, or want to know more about any of these techniques, uh, yeah, just reach out to us. Um, we'll get back to you, as also as Carolyn mentioned. So I think um, we are ready for uh, questions. Yes, we are. So thanks so much for the presentation, Philip and Andras. Um, we're now going to open the floor to questions, which we uh, will be answering live. So once again, if you have any questions, please feel free to just drop them into the chat panel. And it looks like we already have some questions submitted. So for our very first question, is it possible to perform multiplexed imaging beyond two or three channels in SMLM? Um, perhaps I can take this, this question. Um, so, as Professor Quirk uh, has shown, we can reliably do uh, three-color imaging with the right fluorophores and filter combinations. However, uh, as our system and most super systems are usually equipped with only three lasers, uh, maybe 405 uh, as well, what this means is that any other detection will need a different system. So, you may see that there's publications relying on DNA paint which means that you have your primary antibody that is detected by a secondary antibody that is then labeled with an oligonucleotide. And then you can, for example, introduce your primary antibodies against uh, 10, 20 targets. Then you can, uh, using microfluidics, flush in your first oligonucleotide labeled uh, secondary antibody, then flush in the detection oligos. Then you can come in with your washing buffer, remove the um, unbound molecules, then perform a DNA paint, which you can then wash out, 
you can introduce the next secondary and the next oligo and then repeat the process until you get a 10 or 20 plex um, yeah, data. So yes, it's possible, but then uh, it may need a slightly different technique. However, um, our system is compatible with this as well. Okay, great. We're having a lot of questions come through. Um, so our next one is, how is the post acquisition data filtered? Autofluorescence and non-specific signal in particular. Um, again, this is something that uh, I didn't go into too much detail uh, in the uh, filtering step, um, as this is uh, something that may have been covered by a previous webinar. However, um, when, when we're looking at and detecting fluorescence from a fluorophore uh, that is designed to be fluorescent, what you expect is that you get a high amount of photons and due to that, the, uh, the center and the precision at which, with which the center of this detection event is uh, localized is much higher than a fluorophore or sorry, than a fluorescent molecule that is not designed to fluoresce that is usually autofluorescent. So simple answer is that there are uh, parameters that uh, such as photon count or localization precision which allow filtering out low quality uh, data while retaining high quality single molecule detections that are coming from actual fluorophores. Okay, great. Our next question, um, it looks like it was asked maybe like in a few different ways, but which are the best dyes to use for three color D-storm imaging? Um, again, there is no one single correct answer for this. Uh, there's a number of publications uh, going back uh, potentially even 10 years uh, by uh, key opinion leaders who screened and tested a number of dyes. For 647, in the 647 channel detection, usually uh, Alexa Fluor 647 or analogs of that are used. Then in the 560 range, fluorophores such as um, Alexa Fluor 532 or CF 568 or CF583R are really suitable. In the 488 range, uh, the amount, the available fluorophores are a bit narrower. And here our recommendation is using, for example, uh, ATO488, which is a nice, bright and photostable molecule. Great, all right, our next question. How do you achieve the entire 10 micrometer tissue imaging while the turf imaging only allows imaging only thickness below one micrometer? So again, um, I, I can potentially take that question. Um, so why I mentioned that it's beneficial to use 10 micron tissue is that in that case, turf works better. So I didn't refer to being able to detect the entire 10 micron. In fact, the aim is that we don't detect the entire 10 micron thick tissues, but rather that if you, for example, use turf, you detect potentially one micron depth in the tissue or even preferably lower, so 500, 200 nanometers in depth. And then by relying on a thinner section, you just remove the autofluorescence. So actually what you're aiming at is not to detect 10 microns, but rather a much shallower depth of imaging. So roughly 200 to 500 nanometers. There are 3D, there are ways of achieving 3D. However, these require uh, a bit more, um, a couple of quantitative methods then ca that can assess how the shape of the individual blinks look. And based on the way that they look, uh, oh, for example, if they are away from the focal plane, they will be uh, elongated in X and Y direction in one way. If they are below the focal plane, they will be elongated in another axis. And then once we've calibrated this, we can then uh, assign based on the shape of these blinks, whether it's coming from above or below the focal plane. And maybe through this method, potentially in highly inclined illumination mode, and so not turf, we can then image the entire 10 microns but uh, this is a bit more difficult, yeah. And the aim is that we actually restrict the focal depth 
rather than increase it to 10 microns uh, using this particular uh, version of the technology. Okay, next question. For immunohistochemistry detection, are you using indirect labeling with fluorescently labeled secondaries? Have you tried signal amplification IHC protocols with opal dyes? So, um, yes, we've used secondary antibodies on some, but also uh, primary labeled antibodies, which, is, which are primarily conjugated, which should give theoretically better resolution um, because they're closer to the uh, primary antibody. But you you don't have to stick with antibodies. You can look at you can use aptamers, so you can play around with the type of immunist chemistry that you are doing in order to generate even better images than we can get with uh, a secondary antibody onto the um, yeah, the primary antibody. So there's a number of ways you can do it, and if you're good at immunocytochemistry, then um, it, it, you can get even better images. Okay, next question is uh, a question as well. Uh, the collagen to patocyte thickness of the tissue could be amenable, amenable by turf imaging? So perhaps I can answer the first part of this, but then I'll uh, refer back to Professor Philip Kirk, who knows perhaps potentially a bit more about the structure of the actual tissue. So again we can detect uh, the depth that i was discussing however in this case as you mentioned and or as you've seen in the, in some of uh, the slides from professor quirk especially the one of the last ones where we had uh, the three colors uh, besides each other in that case uh, we weren't looking at it we weren't looking at the structures where uh, where the I think the collagen was below or right on the cover slip and on top of it, it was the uh, the other fluorophores and the other structures. However, uh, we were looking at it from the side. So if we're looking at it from the side rather than from uh, the below up, then we can definitely uh, detect uh, the distances uh, and detect all the three structures. If in certain cases the sectioning is in a way where we section it where they are on top of each other, in that case we may not detect all three, or um, we may, but then they will be fully overlapping rather than if looking at it from the profile in which way they are um, separated. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. So one of the important aspects is that th these are very complicated three-dimensional structures, and so what you're what you're doing is I mean, if you imagine that they're a ball then you know, if you cut straight across the ball you'll get certain structures in the appropriate um, orientation whereas if you glance off the ball then uh, you'll get a different orientation so the key thing about the renals is to choose the areas where you have you know, the nicely aligned um, structures of the wall so you've got you can see the capillaries the um, collagen and other structures which are within the basement membrane and then the podocytes and the nephrine so it's a matter of selecting which bit of that 3d structure you are looking at in order to then go in and quantitate it so it's one of the major problems of as you go deeper and deeper in, and get to low you know, higher and higher resolutions and lower um distances that you actually have to very carefully to ensure that you have the right three-dimensional orientation of that bit of the structure that you are looking at wonderful all right just due to timing i'm going to take um one more question but um we will be emailing the questions directly to andras and philip afterwards but we will take one more the question is how are the tissue sections mounted on high precision cover slips to have a flat imaging surface without even space between the tissue section and the cover slip? Is there a detailed protocol or method published somewhere that you know of? 
Um, so we we coat the cover slips um, in in order to try and get the tissue section as flat as possible on, onto the cover slip. Um, but it's not difficult, and uh, that's what you know, makes me feel that one day this will be a routine technology within a histopathology lab because you know, it's not difficult stuff. Um, if you're good at immunocytochemistry uh, and once you've learned how to use the instrument, then it's, uh, you know, it's pretty straightforward. And that's what's been such a big surprise uh, and so much easier than learning electron microscopy. So um, I'm very hopeful, but of course we have to prove that and do lots and lots more studies to uh, demonstrate the advantages and also you know, what new biology we might better pick up by looking at individual uh, antibodies and individual structures. Because you know, we get to see uh, when we use laminin in the basement membrane, when we use collagen, we get to see the individual proteins. So it looks very different to what we see on an H and E, which is a, a a homogeneous uh, pink band. Um, now we're looking at the individual proteins. We have to relook at what we understand about the uh, the disease process, and out of that will probably come new insights into what's actually going on and what goes on in earlier disease. So uh, it's a very exciting area. It's like you know, being given a new toy and opening up a new realm of discovery. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to us having a lot more fun with this technology. Oh, wonderful. All right, and it seems we're now at time. So a very big thank you to Dr. Quirk and Dr. McCloshey. Um, if we were unable to get to your questions, I know there were a lot of questions still floating. We'll do our absolute best to contact you and answer them individually. Once again, this webinar was recorded and therefore if you need to refer back to it, you can. All these recordings can also be found within our resources section on our website, so make sure to check that out. And thank you to all the attendees for joining us today. And upon exiting the webinar, you will receive a very short survey, and that helps us provide feedback on your experience and tell us if you are in need of being contacted. And thank you, and we hope that everyone has a great rest of the day. Goodbye, everybody.